Is that working? All right. All right. Thank you well, so much. Go ahead, Andrew. Do your thing. Uh, I just <laughs> wanted to say thank you, everybody. Thank you, Terry, for being the one person here. But uh, thank you for coming to another attorney lecture series. Thank you, Rocky, for doing this again. I think believe this is your third time with us. So I appreciate that and uh, run away with it. Perfect. Well, and I did want to thank you, Andrew, because, you know, this is, I think, my third time. And this is one of my very favorite groups to present to. And Terry, you're going to be like on the spot here. I don't know if you were prepared for that, <laughs> but um, I know that this is recorded. And so for all of those who may be watching after or who may be coming in a little bit late, I know it's summer. Um, and it's hot out and we are all lately, it seems like super, super busy. Um, but I did want to thank Andrew and the Fort Bend County Law Library. It is always an honor to be invited to speak. Um, and I really do enjoy this group. And so it's always an honor and a privilege. I hope that I'm able to um, provide some nuggets that will be helpful. For those of you who may not know me, I am Rocky Pilgrim. I am an attorney. I've been practicing primarily family law for about the past gosh, it's almost 20 years now, I am feeling old. Um, and today I'd like to chat with you a little bit about some of my experiences over the past two decades. Now, all of these lessons that I wish I'd learned and things like that have come up in a lot of presentations, um, but I'm hoping to give this a little bit of a different spin and if not, maybe provide some reminders. So welcome to the club. The practice of law is not easy. It is not for the faint of heart. Um, I think that we all have our ideas about what it means to be a lawyer. If you grew up with lawyers in the family, you had that perspective. But if you didn't, then you had a lot of, you know, Perry Mason, again, I'm dating myself, um, or other television shows or things like that. Um, but none of it is actual reality until you're living it and doing it. Um, in a lot of these presentations, um, again, I hear like things I didn't learn in law school or things I wish I'd learned in law school. As I was going through this list, I realized I don't think that I would have wanted to learn these things in law school. I'm really seeing these as things that are life lessons. I'm seeing these as things that I would have hoped to have learned maybe before I went to law school. Um, but we learn enough stuff in law school. We are being trained to think and analyze and you know, do all the things as lawyers do. And I don't think that adding additional extraneous stuff on top of that would necessarily have helped it to stick. Um, but these are things that are critical to a successful practice. And so I'd like to go over them just a little bit. Now, just a little bit of background for me. Like I mentioned, I've been practicing for almost 20 years and I started out on my own um, and opened up my own practice fresh out of the gates back when I was licensed in 2003. Now, I was not from the Houston area. Um, I was not from the Richmond area. I was from South Texas. I grew up and went to school in Harlingen. My undergraduate degree is from what used to be called Pan American. Um, and then I went to law school in Boston. And so I had zero connections, zero idea about what to do in Houston but I was engaged and my fiance's kids lived here. And so this is where we landed. And so over the past 20 years, I've maintained my own office. I've never worked for another attorney. Um, and I realize now that I'm almost 20 years in where I could have done some things a little bit differently. Um, and a lot of lessons that I think you only learn when you're really doing it. Um, it's, it's all in theory until your hands are actually on it. So, First lesson, embrace the discomfort. I don't know that I necessarily struggled with this, except I did. Um, and it had a whole new context when I was in a new area doing a new um, type of law. And all of a sudden you have all of these people that you feel like are literally judging you. You don't wanna screw anything up. And now you have these people's lives literally in your hands but get over it because you're gonna screw up, mistakes are gonna be made. And the way that you handle those mistakes and the way that you handle your discomfort in not knowing everything and not being totally certain of yourself is the key to learning and being able to take those lessons 
And instead of letting them hold you back because either your pride's in the way or you get mad or you're getting defensive. And so you hold your position, even though you're clearly wrong, um, that's what holds you back. So the key is acknowledge the screw up, know that things are going to happen. And the key is you fess up. Yeah, I messed that one up. How do I fix it? How do I learn from this? And how do I get better? And this is how you build your reputation. This is how you build your skills. And this is how you build your practice. Second, sorry. You alone are responsible for you. Um, I think that in a lot of ways we are taught, and I, I'm going to say some things that are going to seem ironically contradictory in a little bit, but by taking radical ownership of your life and your world, that's when real change is gonna happen. That's when you're really going to be able to accomplish great things. And instead of feeling like you're waiting or that your success is dependent, taking it into your own hands and realizing that everything that happens to you or by you is because of you, um, that just takes things to a whole new level. I think that one of the really, really important things in this arena is understanding that sometimes random things are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. You're gonna mess things up like we were just talking about. But if you take responsibility for that and ownership for that and say, yeah, these are some things I could have done differently. These are these are ways that I could have prepared for that better or differently. That's how you start really building reputation. That's how you start feeling the confidence that comes with being in control and being the person who is in charge of the direction of your life. This has to do not just with your personal life and not just with your business life, because not everybody is going to own their own business. And Terry, I think that you have your own practice, right? Uh, that's correct. I started out with uh, two other law firms, but then uh, for the last uh, 20 years, I've had my, my own firm, 20 plus. Yep. And so even when you don't have your own firm, it's so critical to understand that your role and your success, no matter what hat you're wearing, no matter what level you're at, no matter what level you want to be at, it's in your hands and it's up to you. We all have the same number of hours in the day. We don't all have the same opportunities. We don't all have the same connections, but that doesn't mean that we can't find ways to get there, that we can't find ways to make things happen. And when you realize that everything is up to you and within your control, then you're able to take responsibility for things like your integrity and your reputation. People are gonna get to know who you are based on your actions and whether or not you say what you mean and you do what you say. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to share all the things, right? One of the things that's important when you're creating relationships, whether they're business or personal, is that people want to know like the real you. Nobody likes the sleazy car salesman. Nobody likes somebody that they feel is just trying to get an angle. Everybody wants to know that someone's being real, that when they've screwed something up, that they were vulnerable enough to say, yeah, I messed this up, because then that gives them permission to do the same. And now suddenly we're not so alone and everybody can improve and build and be stronger independently and together. Um, this radical ownership um, is what will help you to be the most successful financially. Um, in your family relationships, in your romantic relationships, by taking this responsibility, it is scary as hell. Not everybody is going to be a business owner um, because when you're the business owner and the lawyer, you're wearing all the hats. And that's a lot of pressure. You have lots of people who are going to be dependent on you and you have lots of different responsibilities that you're going to be carrying. But again, even outside of that role, feeling like you're the one who's in charge is a lot of pressure. It's scary. And so we find a lot, um, and you guys, I'm sure, are all watching social media. 
you watch our news programs, you watch all of these drama shows and reality shows. And a lot of times nobody wants to take responsibility. And when somebody is calling somebody else out, then they're the jerk or they're the a-hole who, you know, just is not compassionate. But you can have compassion and still insist on ownership and responsibility. And so I think that if I would have had that understanding and really been able to engage with this concept, because I kind of knew it, right? Like I was pretty independent. I'd taken care of things, but really fully engaging with this concept was not something that I, I think I understood until probably the last, you know, five, eight, 10 years. And that makes a, a big difference in how I run my practice and how I interact with other people. Um, and honestly, with some of the boundaries that we've created. Now, be proud, stay humble, keep learning. All of these things are gonna kind of overlap and be very similar, um, but there are some subtle nuances. When there is a fine line between hubris and pride, and that line is when you are rightfully um, proud of accomplishments and achievements. And let's be real, going to law school and passing the bar that is not anything to sneeze at. Like that is hard. There is also life that's going on at the same time. And law school is like three years of hazing basically to see if you're going to be able to survive as an attorney. And all of that work and effort and sweat and tears that was put in by you and your family, that is something to be amazingly proud of. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden, because you, you know, graduated law school and passed the bar, then now you can be a jerk because you're a lawyer and you're smarter than everybody else. And these other peons, you know, why do they think that they have the right to have an opinion? Um, not everybody goes there, but sometimes um, you have like, man, I got here and this was my perception of what this role meant. And that sometimes ends up in some, in some hubris, some over pride. And the thing to keep in mind is you should be proud. You should be proud to be an attorney. I'm proud to be a family lawyer. I know that family law, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, well, that's what you do when you can't do anything else, which is actually not true um, because family law, I mean, nobody else is going to be touching our families any more frequently other than maybe traffic court. And we have to know about every other area of law. It's just people don't like to get into the ick of emotion and feeling but that's the reason why we're here. This is life. We're dealing with people's lives, the things that are most important to them, their relationships, their children, their property, their ability to keep their job. All of these things we should take pride in. We're surrounded by lawyer jokes. We are surrounded by, you know, the stereotypical, you know, oh, you know, watch that one. Um, for the longest time, when I was introducing myself to people, I would say I was self-employed. I would not tell them that I was an attorney. I didn't want to get go down that road. I didn't want the lawyer jokes. And then I didn't want the hit ups for free advice um, because I probably wasn't going to know about the random thing that they were asking about anyway. But once we get to this point, have pride in it, but realize this is not the end of the journey. This is just the beginning of the journey. Just like we went from crawling to walking to running we don't rest on our laurels just because now we're licensed and we're practicing attorneys. Every person that you meet, every experience that you have, even if you've done thousands of cases and this next case that came in is just like the thousand you just handled, there is going to be something unique about this person or their circumstance. You can learn from all of those. There isn't a person of any status or any role that can't contribute in some way. And if you keep yourself open to having those experiences and keeping yourself just open-minded as to, okay, let me pause and not get stuck into my rut. I don't, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I know lawyers who've been doing it for over 30. And it's like, no, this is the way it's done. This is the way it's gonna be. Um, you young people just don't understand, but, that's kind of the fight between the millennials and the boomers, right? The problem is the answer is somewhere in between. 
both sides can learn from the other side. And so long as you don't get backed into your corner, then your success, the value that you're going to be able to bring to your community and to your clients, the value you're going to bring to yourself and your quality of life um, is going to be huge. One of the things that is important and that I think gets overlooked a little bit, and I'm going to talk in a minute about um, continuing education, but there is a lot going on right now in the world, for example, of technology. Um, it was like all of a sudden people were talking about AI and within days now we have the ability to draft pleadings and we have the ability to create all these things like memos and papers and social media blogs and probably almost anything that you can imagine. And we were forced when COVID hit in 2020 into a very violent shove to the technological era. This is a good example of if you don't rest on your laurels and you understand that life is all about continuing to improve and learn and go into arenas where you're uncomfortable, like intentionally doing things that are uncomfortable or outside of your area of expertise. That's how you keep your brain firing. That's how you keep the neurons growing. That's how you can be prepared for when something like COVID hits and all of a sudden everybody's on Zoom and what is Zoom? And how is that different from WebEx as we were talking about before we started this presentation? Um, and how are we going to adapt? Because if you don't keep yourself learning about all the things, not just about how to be a better lawyer and about changes in the law, but about all the things that come in life and around it, then you're doing yourself a huge disservice because I'm pretty sure you're gonna be fairly uncomfortable um, when life is moving around you and you really, really just want it to stay still, but also to your clients and to others. Um, I recently had an experience with an attorney where he very clearly was not keeping up on even basic education. Um, I was glad he at least had an email address, but when I pointed out a couple of things, including the new um, Rule 194 mandatory initial disclosures and all the work that was going to have to go into this case if they didn't reach an agreement, he you could tell he was kind of panicking. And you don't want to try to give your client advice at the time that you're trying to learn things. And so this is going to tie in just a little bit to some of the helping and supporting professionals that I'm going to get to in a second. But the key is keep learning. You don't have to keep learning law stuff. And that will help to serve you in all the different ways, including this one. You're a lawyer, whether or not this is your firm or you're working for a firm. The practice of law is a business. You deserve to get paid. A lot of the stereotypical lawyer jokes are, you know, mostly probably about PI attorneys, right? Ambulance chasers. They're greedy. They might get these million dollar judgments and the actual um, victim only gets a few thousand, you know, things like that. There's a lot of stigma associated with thinking that lawyers are overpaid, that they don't work enough, that somehow it's unfair. And I mean, sorry, Andrew, but I call bullshit. We have worked really, really hard to get to this point. This is where that pride comes back in, right? And for whatever reason, and attorneys fall into the heading, even though they don't necessarily, we don't necessarily think of it this way, we're helping professionals, right? We are in the helping profession. We are service-oriented industry. But somehow, whenever you're in a helping profession, there's some kind of associated guilt about getting paid for doing that work. Like social workers apparently aren't supposed to get paid and counselors aren't supposed to get paid. And lawyers, man, they're way overpaid. But every other industry and every other business is designed so that you can survive and make a living. And that's why we do this. And honestly, as attorneys, we take on a lot of our clients' burden. They come to us with problems that they need to solve and they don't know how to solve them. And they're looking to us to help fix this for them. 
And it's not just the technical expertise and the time that it takes actually doing your job, but there is a lot of mental and emotional baggage that comes with that. And there are lots of times when it's not like you're gonna be able to help but think about a case, even though you're supposed to be at home at dinner or in the shower and things like that. And so don't feel guilty about getting paid. Learn how to run your business as a business. It doesn't matter if you're an associate for somebody or if it's the business that you have started on your own. One of the things that comes up a lot in the surveys that they give to young attorneys, um, and I guess even to some of the older attorneys about things they didn't learn in law school or what you wish you learned in law school. I wish I'd learned about the business side of it. I wish I'd learned about marketing and networking. I don't know that law school is necessarily the best arena for that, but that is definitely a skill that if you are going to run a business, you're responsible for knowing. Um, again, it's that radical ownership and responsibility. It is your job to make sure that you have the tools. One of the biggest problems that we have, especially if we've gone straight from high school to college to law school, is if you haven't worked where you've needed to be in that kind of a leadership position, you don't know what you don't know. And so I think even before law school, when people are trying to decide what kind of work they're gonna do, or when you're teaching your children um, about what they're gonna do or what they may wanna do when they're older, knowing the front and back of the house in terms of what happens in businesses, not just the consumer end, but what happens behind the scenes. Um, that type of an education and that type of exposure is an amazing gift that you can give to anybody. And it's never too late. I know that we have lots of small groups, small um, firms, solo support arenas. I know the state bar has the solo small firm um, law practice management stuff. Take advantage of all those things. We get busy, but it takes more time to fix the stuff that goes wrong than the time that it takes to invest. We're going to get into a really hardcore lesson on that in just a minute. But just remember, there are lots of resources, and I can say this with much confidence. I've been practicing for almost 20 years, and it was only within the last five, maybe, that I picked up an actual business book. Like, I just figured I'm smart, I can do it, I got it, and I am smart, and I've been very successful at running my office. But if I would have given myself these other tools, how much better could I have done? How much more successful could I have been? How much more could I have helped my colleagues um, as they struggle with running their practices and understanding what it really means to wear all the hats? Because when it's your firm, or if you're given a leadership position, you're wearing all the hats. You don't only have to be the lawyer, which means that you're doing all the lawyer things, intake, meeting with the clients, drafting, going to court, negotiating, all of that stuff. You're also wearing all of the other hats. Like, how are you gonna get clients in? What kind of marketing is gonna be effective? And man, we've done all sorts of presentations and there are lots of companies that wanna sell marketing for attorneys. Um, but we all know the best marketing is word of mouth, which falls again back on reputation, right? But you also have to be the bookkeeper. You're the one who's actually closing the sales. You are the one who, I don't know, do you have a cleaning person? Who's organizing the office? Who's set up the office? Who's designed it? There are all sorts of hats that you wear when you're running your law firm. And if you're not aware of all of those hats, it's just like any other small business. And we all know that over 80% of small businesses fail. They don't fail because the person didn't know what they were doing in their craft. They fail because the person didn't know how to run a business as a business. And so there are lots of um, resources that are out there. Probably the most comprehensive, but quick and easy to digest read that I've had is the E-Myth. Um, which in this day and age, we think of electronic, but really it was the entrepreneurial myth by Michael Gerber. That's one of the quintessential business books that I recommend to everybody. And then we go right into this next one, which is you don't have to go it alone. You don't have to be the bookkeeper and the person who sends out the billing and all of the other things. You have 
the ability to create the team that you want to have and to let them provide you with the support that you need. These things, oh goodness, we're going to end in 10 minutes, Andrew. Um, I can either speak really, really fast or we'll restart the the meeting. Um, I'll sorry, guys. Another one. I'll create another one in a minute. <laughs> um, but hire people. I didn't start hiring support staff until I was several years in. And why in the world do I need to be spending time where I could be billing, let's say $200 an hour and doing some task that I could pay somebody $10 an hour for? The math just does not work out. But we all have control issues. All attorneys have a certain personality that just lends itself to not wanting to delegate and not wanting to give up control. But for the love of your sanity, hire people, delegate. You don't have to have full-time staff. It doesn't have to be somebody that you have to bring in for 40 hours a week with all the benefits and all the things. It is not a sign of weakness to have support. Um, and this doesn't mean just support staff. We have all sorts of other people who can help us when we're in a bind. Talk to your colleagues, staff cases with them, vent to them. Um, one of the critical things that I think is important, and it doesn't matter what stage of the game you're in, find a good mentor. Find people who are doing the things that you wanna do the way that you wanna do them and hang out with them because they will help to pull you up to their level. If you're staying around the same people that are just like you or you're the one that's pulling them up, then you're never gonna be able to grow and the success that you're able to reach is just not going to be the same. I mean, you can still have success, but it's not going to be at the level that you're probably hoping for. Now, let's see. This includes being friends with non-lawyers. If you hang out with people who are all like you, and all we do, because we do this a lot, right? As lawyers, I think that it's a, um, a defense mechanism, right? But if we have a situation where, and if you guys haven't seen it, Andrew's dropped the new meeting ID in the chat. Um, but if you don't have people who don't do what you do around to give you their perspective, then you're doing, again, a disservice to yourself and to your clients. I started doing amicus work, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago. And I was terrified that I was going to screw some kid up. I was like, I don't know what I had. Why am I here? You know? Um, and so I scheduled an appointment with a mental health provider that I trusted. And I was like, okay, look, this is what's going on. I want to make sure that I know what I'm doing. And she kind of laughed at me and she was like, you can trust yourself and your instincts. It's fine. But if you have any questions, reach out. And I have done that throughout my career. I ask the questions, not when we're in the middle of a firefight, but when it's time to kind of debrief. And I'm like, you know what? This is kind of an academic question, but what do you guys do in this situation? Or this is a thing that comes up a lot. Or really, how do I, you know, sell that property that's in the, you know, Central America? Having professionals where that's their business, that's their area of expertise helps to give you perspective, it helps to educate you, and then you still have, on top of that, resources that you're able to give to your clients. It also helps a bit because when we hang out with people who are just like us, we're just getting a bunch of confirmation bias, right? They're like, yeah, you're right. And they're not really necessarily going to challenge us because that's not their job. But also hanging out with people in your community, volunteering, um, having a hobby where you see other people, it keeps you in touch with the real world and with what other people are experiencing. Um, Andrew, do you want to pop? Do we want to pop into that other meeting now before we just randomly get cut off? Yeah, yeah. I'll try. I'll try clicking yeah, on it and jumping. That's where we're on. gonna go. Cool.
All right. Um, and so we were just talking about being friends with the non-lawyers because that helps to give perspective, right? Um, and it helps just to overlap with all the other things. It helps to keep you fresh. It helps to keep your mind elastic. And it absolutely is gonna serve you and your clients. So next, virtual reality is not a complete reality. I am one of the people who absolutely loves Zoom. I am so glad that we're able to do this meeting this way. Um, it's way easier for many people. It's less expensive. We're able to record it more easily. All the things I will say, it's good. It's not the best. Um, it's really, really important that we don't lose the interpersonal connections that can only come by being in physical proximity. And it's just, there are so many different facets to this. First, there's just so much in terms of communication that gets lost. It's better when we're on Zoom or in a video conference because we're able to see a little bit of the body language, we're able to see expressions and things like that, at least when people have their video on. Um, but body language and nonverbals account for like the vast majority of communication and you lose almost all of that, even when you're by video conference, but especially if you're just doing things by phone. And when you're meeting people, when you're meeting people who are non-lawyers and you're trying to develop relationships with them. I love social media because I have been able to discover things I never would have known even existed. I've been able to find information super, super fast. And I've been able to meet people from all over the world that I never would have been exposed to. But at the same time, when I'm only seeing posts that people wanna post because they're either happy or they're super, super sad and they're trying to get attention for that. That's not the real world. It's like the pressure that a lot of our kids and teens feel where they're struggling and they're having all of this insecurity, but look at my friend who's posting this thing and they're just doing amazing and they don't have those problems. And we all know that it's not true. Cognitively, we know that it's not true, but emotionally we still buy into it. Like we just can't help it because the visual matters, right? And when you're meeting people in person, it helps to bring that different dynamic. It helps to build trust. Um, it's only when you get to know people outside of a work context and you get to know them as a human that the real trust and the real relationship building can happen. And so I strongly encourage everybody all the time, and I've done this for forever, go to the live conferences. Um, I know everybody wants to go to advanced and that's where everybody goes. That's where all the judges go. Yeah, go to advanced, but also go to the small local or the, I'm sorry, the small local bar conferences. I know that Montgomery County has a happy hour every month. Um, lots of the bar conferences will do that. The, the Houston bar, I know that the Fort Bend Family Bar Association has a CLE um, on the first, first or third Thursday of every month go to those, meet people, let them see you out of context. Because when you're just passing in the hall at the courthouse, which we don't even do that much anymore, you're just not getting the type of interaction that happens organically and happens without us even thinking about it. Um, Joe Navarro is one of the world's leading experts on body language and negotiating and things like that. And he's written several books, two are that I really enjoy. One's called Louder Than Words, and the other one is called Be Exceptional. And he goes a lot into the biology that goes into the body language things. It's not an accident that the type of clothing that you wear and the way that it's shaped and the way that it shapes your body makes a difference in how people perceive you. And we all like to think that we're not judgy, but in order to survive, we have to make certain assumptions based on the things that we see and experience. And so we know that if somebody is dressed one way, that that's probably a good idea about how they're going to be versus if they're dressed in a different way. It's one of the reasons that we need to have some formality when we're in court, even if it's by Zoom, because it's that presentation and that physical interaction that really helps to set the stage for the psychology of how people are approaching a situation. 
um, it it's really kind of it's both fascinating and a little bit disappointing when we learn about really the the biological um, underpinnings of how and why we process information. And I would strongly encourage everybody to pick up some books about that. Um, I've got a long list, but it goes into every interaction that we have, all of our negotiating. And if you learn about those things and you understand them, it will absolutely give you a leg up in your practice. Speaking of which, it's okay to think outside the box. We all, I think, um, and part of this is that radical ownership and accountability, right? We all wanna be like, hey, I was following the form and we have form builder and the state bar, the family law section is fantastic at promulgating forms. Um, our Supreme Court has tried to put out some forms. And by doing that, I think we can all understand why we don't necessarily want to be a slave to form. Um, it's okay to do something differently. Just do it mindfully. It is not where you just want to come up with some random thing that's not based in any kind of logic or based in something that's happened before that's not working. But just because something's in ProDoc or in Form Builder does not mean that that's the only way that it can be done or should be done. Sometimes there are better ways to do that. All of these forms were created by people just like you and me, and they've just gone through lots of tweaks and lots of editing, and then we send them out there to, to help the bar. That doesn't mean that they can't stand to be updated or tweaked and things like that. I mean, let's be real, that's how case law is made because something just wasn't working or it could work better or differently. And so somebody had the courage to speak up and to say something about that. So be active, have conversations with people, be vulnerable, um, have your trusted folks around you. Like I said, your support team, your mentors, ask them, is this really just crazy or you think this could work? And you might be the next person who helps to innovate and come up with some new way of doing things because that's how things get done. We don't always have to wait until something's on fire and then we try to fix it. Getting active, by the way, with your local bar and with the state bar is an absolutely fantastic way to do that. And I strongly encourage everybody. I mean, I think it's important to give back to our communities generally, but this is a great way to see the behind the scenes of how things are done and how the forms get made and all of the committees that are working hard to support the family bar and um, all of the attorneys and whatever uh, subject matter you're in. And so get involved and ask some questions. There's always somebody who's gonna be happy to chat with you about that. Now, work-life balance is a BS concept. And I know that we talk about this a lot, we talk about quality of life. We talk about burnout. We talk about um, getting recharged and how we can have our home life be balanced with work life and making sure that a company or a firm that we work for is sensitive to that and all of those sorts of things. I am going to challenge that concept by saying that it's bullshit. There's no such thing as work-life balance. It's never gonna be in balance. I don't know that anybody wants it to be in balance. What you have is your life and the experience of your life. And if you take responsibility for that, then you get to define what your experience is like across all aspects of your life, which is not just work. It's not just home. It's also your spiritual life. It's your financial obligations, your relationships with your family, your personal development and personal wants and interests, all of those things flow. It's kind of like a great marriage. A great marriage is not a 50-50 concept. There are going to be times when one spouse just does not have the spoons. And if you're not familiar with spoon theory, I have some links for that too. But they don't have the spoons or the energy to be at 50% or 100%. All they got is 20 and so the great marriages, the great partnerships, the great relationships, the great world that you build is when, okay, I've only got 20% and 
and you have a partner or you have built the stability on the other side where it can step up past the 50% to make up for the 30 that's missing. And that's the ebb and flow of life. And that's what's going to happen all the time. The key is to not let inertia take over. And that's what tends to happen. We as attorneys are always worried about the next case that's going to come in because that's how we pay our bills. And so we get a little bit panicked and we tend to get overloaded. And then cases that were not supposed to be so complicated all of a sudden are blowing up and the car has a flat and the baby's sick and all of the things happen. It's pausing and being very intentional about how you are building your life and your experience that matters. I know that there's that saying, it's it was just business, it's not personal. I think that that's bullshit too. It's all personal. We are humans, we are people. And whether our experience is when we have our working hat on or when we have our mommy hat on or our daddy hat on or when we have our spouse hat on, all of the experiences that we have impact us. We carry those with us. And it's in how we process those things and in how we allow them to interact with each other that creates the whole of our lives. And if we don't step back and think about our existence and our experience in that sort of holistic way, then we're doing a disservice to ourselves because we're nitpicking certain areas and we think, okay, well, if the wheels are falling off the car, I'm going to get really cool mags on the front passenger side. And then I'm not sure about what's going to happen to this rear driver side, but I'm just going to put a bicycle tile on that one for now. And we'll just deal with it when it falls off. You have to look at it as a whole, which is your life. And one of the ways that is not necessarily counterintuitive, but we usually think about it in terms of financial goals or business goals. But if you think about it in terms of life goals, if you think about what your ideal life looks like and what you would be doing at any given point in time, once you have that actually visualized and you know what that means to you and why, because if you're doing it because your mama said that you needed to get that fancy car and so you need to work real hard so that you can get that fancy car, but you actually hate that car and you really, really wanted the sports car, it's not going to work out for you. Um, it's It just is not going to flow. But if you are being authentic and honest with yourself and you can visualize what you want, you can reverse engineer your life from there because you're going to know. How much money is it going to take to fund this life? Okay. What skills do I have? What resources do I have? What do I need to do in order to be able to meet that? Right. And I want to make sure that I spend this much time with my kids. And I want to make sure that I spend this much time volunteering. You can't do that unless you're super intentional because we all know practicing law is an 80 plus hour a week job. If we let it, our clients would absolutely consume every last waking and sleeping moment that they'd be able to, not because they're malicious, not because of any selfishness on their part, they're just in crisis and they're relying on us and they are panicked. And so we have to be intentional and not get caught up in their drama, but be able to step back and say, okay, hold on a second. I'm feeling something. I know that there's been a boundary violation for me and that I'm real mad about something because my body will feel mad. I will be angry. I'm like, okay, something went sideways because I'm not usually having that kind of a response. And that's just the reminder to me to pause and be like, okay, what is going on right now that makes me feel like I'm Jack tumbling down that hill? Um, and how do I stop that tumble? And it really just is maintaining awareness and keeping your eye on the prize. And the prize is not this case. It's not this year. It's what quality of life do I want to have? And how do I create that for myself? Because if your life at work sucks, you're going to be bringing that home. And if things at home are falling apart, it's definitely going to be impacting you at work. And so work-life work, work -life balance, nah. Ebb and flow, yes. But it's all contained within within the whole of your experience. Now, we always say, I don't have time for that. Oh man, I would really like to do that. I just, I don't have time. I'm really busy today. I've got all these things that are going on. I I would love to go visit you guys, but I just, I, I have to get through this season. I have to get through 
you know, it's really busy during the summer because everybody wants to have a hearing before school starts. We know and we can learn about what our workflow is going to be like, especially if we're reverse engineering it like we want to or like we should want to. There is some weird badge of honor that seems to come with having significant burnout. We like to talk about how we want to refuel. For helping professionals, but let's set that down and let's not buy into that. It's not actually a badge of honor to work yourself to death, to be at the office for 20 hours a day. There's a certain competition, I think, um, and a certain mentality that if you are not burning the candle at both ends and in the middle, that somehow you're not earning this really super high salary that you've got, or you're taking advantage or somebody else is doing it better. And so they're gonna get promoted before you are. They're gonna do better than you are. They're gonna get the clients before you will. And that's crap. There's plenty of work to go around. There's plenty of money to be made for everybody. And nobody's gonna care that you worked yourself to death. And I really hate to say it. And if no one has said it to you yet, you're not that important. I mean, we like to feel that we are and to our clients in the moment we are. And of course, to your family, we are. And of course, just as a human, you are important, but life is gonna go on. Life's gonna go on if you work yourself into the hospital because your body does keep the score. That is a great book by Bessel van der Kolk. Everybody should read it. Um, your body remembers. There is a physical retention that happens when you are under stress, when you are not recharging. And it really frustrates the hell out of me when people think that a mom and a professional and a person can recharge with a bubble bath and a glass of wine, because it's just not true. You're not going to recover. Those things help and those little bits and pieces help. But when we think that we can make do with 15 minutes here, an hour there, I shouldn't feel guilty that I didn't work all weekend. I still carry that. I'm preaching it. But of course, that's still something that's ingrained in us. And I will challenge everybody to say, that doesn't have to be my experience. And everybody's just a little bit, you know, crappy about it too. Like if somebody takes a vacation or if they take regular vacations, heaven forbid, or they never work a weekend, you know what people are going to tell them? Must be nice. Gosh, I wish I was independently wealthy. What is that? All of that is about insecurity and the fact that you have not taken enough ownership, that you have created the life that you want. And so you're mad at yourself about it. You're going to take it out on these people who are living the life that they deserve. Because yeah, if that's what you want to do and you can swing it, do it, enjoy it. Show me how. That's the attitude that we should have to build each other up so that that becomes the normal, not this oh no, you have to build this many hours and you're not allowed to smile and all of that crap. We, we only have this life and the time will be made, right? We can either make it intentionally or we can take the time because there's an emergency or because there's a... Um, health issue. I mean, how many attorneys do you know that have major, major health issues? And I was just talking to somebody else, um, one of my coaching clients, and she's talking about all of these physiological problems that she has, and then went on to explain all of the stressors that she's had in her life for the past few years. And I was like, I hate to tell you, but that's not a coincidence. And all of these drugs that you're going to be taking are going to help with the symptoms. They're not going to fix the problem. And it's critical that we remember why we're doing this and that we're intentional about it. And the way that one person recharges is not going to be the same as the way a different person recharges. We do a lot of brain work. I hate sitting at a desk all the day. That's what we do. And so I love to go out and volunteer in like a physical arena. I volunteer with the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo with the Fort Bend County Rodeo. Um, I also have an organizing business, like a literal physical organizing business. And it's like, why would you do that? Like you're wasting time doing that when you could be doing lawyer work and making all of this money. Well, I hate to say it, 
But when I clean somebody's closet or pantry and they're like bouncing off the walls, giddy, and I have that immediate tangible win and I have done some physical exertion. So I've got the endorphins going and I have all the happy chemicals going. I may be tired, but I am so charged up and I have so much energy in those moments because that's what speaks to me. I hate facials. I hate going to the spa. I'm so bored, but that may be somebody else's recharge. They want to go for a week and all they do is lay in a hammock and do nothing and just soak up the sun. Do what speaks to you because that's really how we end up being successful and maintaining the longevity that we need, right? Not just in our careers, but also that's how we create the kind of life that we want. We are not working. We are not living. Sorry. We see those are Freudian slip right there. We are not living so that we can work. We are working to fund our life. That's why we're doing that. We may have other whys for why we have selected a particular industry. Like we like to help people. We like the subject matter, whatever, but we work for money to fund our lives. And if we understand that's the core concept, not that we're just living and breathing so that we can make it back to work the next day with a roll of Pepsid, that's what's gonna help you keep perspective. That's going to make you so much better at this job. And it's going to help your experience and your life in all arenas better. And so, yeah, take the time, plan for the time you have to block it and you have to block it without there being the chance that it can be interrupted. It has to be an emergency if you have to call it that, but something that is just non-negotiable because if you don't, because we all know if there's an emergency, we drop what we're doing, we leave the courthouse, we do what we have to do to take care of that emergency. If you take that mentality and realize that you can do the same thing without an emergency or a disaster actually happening, then it changes your whole perspective on life and how we do things. And so that was number 10. Here's your bonus, which is you gotta have fun. And this is gonna sound really funny and it's not just the timeout and the recharge stuff. There are studies that show that if you don't intersperse some kind of fun and creativity into your hopefully daily life, but definitely regularly, it kind of stifles you in all the places. So remember, do something frivolous. When people, my mom likes to send me off, right? All of our parents send us off with, okay, be careful, make good choices. And I always send everybody off with, okay, do something frivolous, you know, be a little bit reckless, just don't get hurt. You know, you gotta live life and experience it. So be creative, have fun. Um, Cause that's what this is all about. So any thoughts, Terry? Thank you so much. You've been like, so amazing. <laughs> uh, no, just so appreciative of the, uh, you know, practical uh, reminders, uh, because, yeah, for about 30 years of my practice, I probably lived to work, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and and now uh, just this last year, it, it was November, uh, November 2022, a sharp, uh, I guess, paradigm shift to uh, uh, mm -hmm. start start to um, uh, you know, just make, make, uh, substantial changes. So now every Friday I work remotely at home. I was taking care of my wife today. So she, I'm at home. She had a small, small surgical deal, but, uh, just like you're saying, you just have to, uh, you know, make time for it because we do. So it's important. So, uh, I just turned everything upside down basically. So now life comes first, uh, work, is uh, uh, second now. Good for you. And that's amazing. And it's really hard because we have every single thing in our culture and our society screaming the opposite. And so I'm really glad. And especially after you've been doing it for so long, it is hard to change that voice in your head. So I am super happy for you and I'm super proud of you. Um, and I bet that your wife appreciates it and your family appreciates it. And I, I hope that you've been having some positive experiences. I would challenge you to, you know, maybe stop working Fridays or Friday at noon. <laughs> Just saying. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm <laughs> taking a sharp uh, step in that direction now. Good. Good for you. And thank you so much. I really did enjoy our um, 
our little bit of interactions that we've been able to have. Good, thank you. Andrew, what are we doing? Are we done? <laughs> the uh, yeah, I he guess. must have, he must have stepped out. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, thank you for volunteering, and then uh, of course you know Andrew as well for coordinating all of this. Very much appreciated. No, yeah, thank, they thank are you amazing. All. Him and Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Yeah. Didn't know, I didn't know you're going to be here. Yeah, no, I never miss these. No, thank y'all for uh, putting on a great, great one again. I didn't know it was going to be about, and I really, really enjoyed it. Really something yeah. to think about. So thank you. <laughs> Nobody knew what it was going to be about. I was <laughs> That's okay. um, speaking about letting time get away from you. I don't think I ever told Andrew, and I was like, hmm, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> no, you did great. Really good. Awesome. Thank well, you, thank man. you guys again. Have a great rest of your week. You as well. Thank you, Rocky. Yep. Bye. bye.